What makes a classic TV show? Some shows take the world by storm, becoming fan favorites remembered for generations. Others are slow starters, growing a following before reaching that tipping point of becoming a fixture on TV screens around the world. And some never reach those heights, achieving cult status among a select group of influential people. Arrested Development has a unique distinction of not only achieving that cult status, but parlaying that into a divisive return, only to have that change how people remember a series that was being called a future classic. The story of Arrested Development, a show about a family that fell apart, held together by one man, will be put together by this one man, trying to understand how we decide what makes a TV show a classic. In the early 2000s, reality television was on the ascent, and that got director and former TV star Ron Howard thinking of new ways of doing television, something that used this reality TV grammar to tell scripted comedies with more depth and layers, while also cutting back on costs. A different kind of situation comedy that would be packed with more jokes, you know, more funny situations, and a less traditional feel than what you get with a, you know, a normal kind of half-hour sitcom. Through the production company he started with Brian Grazer, Imagine Entertainment, Howard approached a number of producers with this concept, and it was Mitchell Hurwitz who connected most with the idea. But I wanted to use that savings in expense and time to shoot a lot of scenes and to try to get at family enmeshment and to try to get at um, character that went beyond stock character. Hurwitz was particularly attracted to the idea of creating characters with greater depth than in your typical sitcom. Hurwitz had been a veteran of many sitcoms, including The Golden Girls, The Golden Palace, The John Larroquette Show, The Ellen Show, and several other programs that didn't start with The. One small project of note was a 1999 series called Everything's Relative, which aired on NBC. Notable not just for starring Jeffrey Tambor, who would be part of the cast of Arrested Development, but also for acting as a half-step between the sitcoms of the past that Hurwitz had started his career working in and what sitcoms of the future would eventually look like. It's a strange combination of the single-camera style with an awkward laugh track thrown in, and the plot of a comedy writer forced to make his dysfunctional family work would very much echo what would eventually become Arrested Development. I've come to a big decision. I am going over the wall to, I am breaking up with the family. Although six episodes were produced, it only ran for four before it was cancelled. But it was this project that would help inform the pitch Hurwitz took to Imagine Entertainment. Hurwitz's original idea for Arrested Development was a dysfunctional family going from riches to rags, though many of the particulars went through a number of changes before it all came together. If a family had stopped developing because they had money, and then they lost all their money, and they go kicking and screaming to a better life. Like, it's the, losing their money is the best thing that ever happened to them. Also, arguably, not in the show. Other aspects of the show came from Hurwitz's own life. Having grown up in California, the famous Bluth Banana Stand was based on a chocolate chip business he started at 12 called The Chipyard. And the street that stand began on, Balboa Boulevard, would be the name of the apartment complex that Lucille Booth would call home. The character of Maybe was even named after Hurwitz's two daughters, May and Phoebe. Outside of his own life, Hurwitz was also inspired by the Enron scandal that saw a massive energy company crumble when it committed an elaborate accounting fraud scheme. The Blue family at the center of the series would similarly be watching their own business crumble all around them. Arrested Development was always supposed to be different. Instead of a finely polished product rehearsed throughout the week and then recorded on a soundstage, it would be filmed on location with little rehearsal. Scenes were written and rewritten on the fly, and the look of the show mimicked a documentary, one shot with two cameras, often moving through scenes scrambling to get reactions. Jason Bateman was cast as Michael Bluth, the one son holding the Bluth family together. Bateman's first on-screen acting job was at the age of 12 on Little House on the Prairie. He would go on to appear in Silver Spoons and It's Your Move. Throughout the 90s, he had a series of failed TV pilots, creating some reluctance to cast him as Michael. But when he auditioned, they found he was the perfect fit for the relatively level-headed member of the Bluth family. The man who wants nothing more than to leave that family, only to be constantly dragged back into their drama. They are going to keep Dad in prison, at least until this gets all sorted out. Also, the attorney said that they're going to have to put a halt in the company's expense account. <gasps> Interesting, I would have expected that after they're keeping Dad in jail. Portia de Rossi was cast as Lindsay Bluth, Michael's twin sister. 
Rossi had made her debut in the 1994 movie Sirens, and before Arrested Development, she was a regular on Ally McBeal. As Lindsay, she was the socialite who spent more time creating the illusion of being a philanthropist than actually doing anything aside from shopping. I'm kind of the charitable one of the family. Yes. I think it's best if you got a job. Oh, come on, I'm a parent. I care about my daughter every bit as much as Michael cares about his son. What grade am I in? What kind of job? Will Arnett played the eldest of the Bluth siblings, George Oscar Bluth Jr., or Job. Job was one of the tougher roles to be cast, with none of the actors auditioning managing to find a suitable voice for the character. Arnett, who only had a few credits to his name, most notably two episodes on The Sopranos, managed to breathe life into the impossibly arrogant and intensely vulnerable Job. And Job is quite the magician. This is the magic trick, huh? Illusion, Michael. Mm. Trick is something a whore does for money. Michael Sarah was cast as Michael's son, George Michael. Only 15 by the time Arrested Development premiered, he had already appeared in several movies and TV shows. George Michael is the timid, well-meaning teen who is struggling to grow up with a father who doesn't quite get him. George Michael is also nursing a confusing attraction to his cousin. I'm tempted to kiss again so we can teach him a lesson. Why would that teach them a lesson? No, I mean uh, to, to freak them out. Yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Well, isn't that what makes it funny? <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> Let's go fish. You know, like, uh, Alias Shawcat was cast as Maybe Funke, Lindsay's daughter. Even though she was only 14 when the show debuted, she'd already come off a nearly 40 episode run on the series State of Grace. Maybe is bolder than her cousin, seeming to lack much empathy as her antics failed to catch the attention of her absent-minded parents. Well, I thought we didn't want anyone to know we were here. Well, it's a little late for that. Our fingerprints are everywhere. You said they weren't going to check for fingerprints. No. I said don't wear your mittens. I didn't want you to look stupid on the security cameras. Tony Hill was cast as the youngest Bluth sibling, Byron Bluth, better known as Buster. Relatively unknown at the time, Hill had guest spots on a few programs, but Arrested Development would be his first major role. Buster is an extremely awkward mother boy who spends much of the series in a state of perpetual confusion. You could be eating my dust all day, slowpoke. And Buster yeah. was starting to give as good as he got. And you might be eating it's gonna f Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. David Cross played Tobias Funke, Lindsay's husband and Maybe's father, although creator Mitch Hurwitz claims to have offered the well-traveled stand-up Cross any role he wanted, Cross said it was the roles of Job and Buster that were suggested to him. Regardless, it was Tobias that spoke to Cross as a character. After a brief struggle with the network to make sure Tobias would have what would be his signature mustache, Cross slipped into the role of a former therapist turned actor who had a very unusual way of choosing his words. Are you gonna buy this time or are you just curious? I suppose I'm uh, bi curious. <laughs> Jeffrey Tambor was originally asked to only play the role of family patriarch George Oscar Bluth Sr. for a single episode. But the role was such a good fit for Tambor that he jumped at the chance to become part of the principal cast. A veteran and beloved from his time as Hank Kingsley on The Larry Sanders Show, Tambor created a George Sr. that was both domineering and slimy, all from the comfort of his prison cell. This is, this is my vacation. I'm exercising. I'm, I'm sleeping well. You're doing time. I'm doing the time of my life. Jessica Walter made up the final member of the principal cast as Lucille Bluth, the sharp-tongued matriarch of the Bluth family. Having been acting for over 40 years, Walter was the most experienced of the cast, notably appearing in Clint Eastwood's directorial debut, Play Misty For Me. Lucille Bluth is a woman so wealthy and out of touch with the common man that she has trouble acclimating to her family's new financial reality. If you're saying I play favorites, you're wrong. I love all my children equally. I don't care for Joe. Although technically not a member of the cast, Arrested Development did have a regular narrator voiced by Ron Howard. Originally, Howard was only a placeholder, but his performance as a detached narrator was so effective and was very charming to the network, he became a permanent fixture for the series. I actually borrowed from National Geographic. I, I thought it should be approached with a, a kind of a sociological or an anthropological um, uh, mindset. I think this is the same narrator who, you know, would, would be doing, um, you know, something about the uh, indigenous uh, inhabitants of the Amazon basin. Uh, and then their next job would be to come and talk about the Booth family. <laughs> <laughs> speech, 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 speech. The 
family continued to chant, speech, 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 for no one in particular. Arrested Development had a very rich world of recurring characters, and it would be nearly impossible to list all of them here. But the ones who appeared most frequently were the family's lawyer, Barry Zuckercorn, played by Henry Winkler, news anchor John Beard, a local Los Angeles news anchor who was portraying a fictionalized version of himself, Liza Minnelli as Lucille Bluth's rival, Lucille Ostero, also known as Lucille II, Mae Whitman, played George Michael's season 2 love interest Anne Veal, and Justin Grant Wade appeared as high school jock, Steve Holt. There was also this mysterious janitor played by Martin Mull. Is it because I'm a private detective? Gene Parmesan, how are you doing? Ah, Gene! Oh, Gene, <laughs> isn't he the best? Gene was far from the best. Oh, he always gets me too. Gene Parmesan, how could I forget him? Now the story of a wealthy family who lost everything. Debuting on November 2nd, 2003 in an episode titled Pilot, we meet the Bluth family just as it seems as though it's ready to fall apart. This is his family. So why is Michael so happy? Because he's decided to never speak to these people again. The cast is introduced through some narration and a few key interactions, and we find out that this episode is about Michael being snubbed for a partnership at his family's business, shortly before George Sr. is arrested. George Bluth was arrested tonight for defrauding investors and using the company as his personal piggy bank. The family looks to Michael to run the business. Even though he wants to leave for the sake of his son, he stays behind. Well, since mom died, it's been kind of lonely and it's just wish we could all stay here. We're an incredibly disappointing family, but we are family. And I want my son to be happy, so maybe we should be in each other's lives. Of course, George Michael might also be motivated by the new crush he has on his cousin, maybe. These guys are actually gonna be staying with us. For a while. It is going to be a little crowded though, so I think you're going to have to share a room with your cousin. You trying to say to me? This, along with many character dynamics, would be explored throughout the season. Unlike other sitcoms that tended to keep a fixed premise and placed it in novel situations in each episode, Arrested Development would introduce dynamics that would run and change as we followed the adventures of the Bluths. Sometimes this would mean dynamics that ran through the entire series, sometimes only for a season or even just a few episodes. George Michael's crush on his cousin went the distance, sometimes becoming the focus of his character and other times just humming along in the background, but it was always safe to assume that, no matter where you are in the series, George Michael is harboring some feelings for maybe. It was a love between two cousins that the world thought was wrong, but it was the world that was wrong. Tiens, tu veux jouer? We have got to see this movie. The pilot was directed by Anthony and Joe Russo, and you may be more familiar with their work on the highest grossing movie of all time. They were a major part of establishing the look of Arrested Development, using a cinema verite style to create the impression of a documentary crew in the thick of it. If the series looks like it was made cheaply, that was by design, as multi-camera sitcoms at the time were becoming increasingly expensive to produce. The quick cuts and rushed production meant that footage sometimes lacked the polish to tell a coherent story, which is part of the reason a narrator was used to fill in the gaps. To, to this day, when we do a rough cut and um, people see it, and that's without Ron's voice on it, People usually say, boy, it's a little hard to follow. It's it's kind of it's kind of confusing. And then Ron gets in there and just slowly describes it all and uh, it tells the story. This was a necessity with shows often having 30 minutes of footage needing to be cut down to 22 minutes for broadcast. It was often suggested that this might be attributed to the actors improving. And while this was the original intention of the series, the writing was so strong that very little of that happened as the series progressed. Alternate takes often came from writers coming up with new jokes on the spot. New jokes and missing plot points were also recorded after the fact later inserted into scenes while a speaking character's back is turned to the camera. I need to prove that I can do this job. Do? To... you. Michael, I'm your big brother. I'll never be impressed with you. In addition to the structure and style of the series, the pilot also establishes some important ways it would differentiate itself from other sitcoms. Families that don't get along weren't an entirely novel concept at this point, even if the opposite were still more common. But Arrested Development added some subtext to the idea by placing Michael and his son in a literal fake home, a model home created by the Bluth Company to sell their new development project, 
Sudden Valley. One of the big charms of the series was its ability to take seemingly meaningless jokes or references and build on them several episodes or several seasons later. Sometimes it was just a running gag, but sometimes it also meant expanding on a moment to create an entire plotline. An example from the pilot is Michael interviewing for a new job at Sitwell Housing. What was originally just a placeholder company was later revealed to be a major rival to the Bluth Company, led by Stan Sitwell, played by Ed Bakley Jr. None of his hair is real, you know. You mean the guy we're meeting with can't even grow his own hair? Come on! Thematically, the show also had some interesting things to say about how the upper class are often just as silly as the rest of us, and got to where they were by being willing to step over others, and each other. And there's the very interesting fusion between family and business throughout the series, connecting love and commerce with disastrous consequences. When George Sr. tells Michael that he didn't promote him to protect him, we find out it wasn't purely out of concern for his son. It had to be your mom. They cannot arrest a husband and wife for the same crime. I don't think that that's true, Dad. Really? I got the worst <laughs> attorneys. And as we'll see throughout the series, the Bluths are never beneath screwing one another over for financial gain, or in some cases, to protect the company. The pilot episode for Arrested Development did so much heavy lifting, I can't possibly cover it all here. And the rest of the series is similarly dense. As we'll see as we move forward, this was often weighed more to its complexity rather than its depth. And it was the show's complexity that played a role in it becoming a revered classic that struggled to find a wider audience. One of the central dynamics of the series, especially in its first season, is the struggle between the Bluth siblings and their parents. One of the ways it manifests itself is in the rivalry between Job and Michael. Job and Michael butt heads in the early episode over Job's girlfriend, Marta, played by Leonor Varea, and then later by Patricia Velasquez when scheduling conflicts arose for the first actress. Job's attitude towards his girlfriend is less than attractive. What I need is freedom. Marta is being interviewed today. I mean, it's bad enough that I gotta go to the award show tomorrow night. Today I gotta stand next to her like I'm Rita Wilson. On the other hand, Michael is completely smitten with Marta and he's conflicted over the fact that he wants to date his brother's girlfriend. Michael had become enamored of Marta when Job was having second thoughts about the relationship. I've made a huge mistake. But when Job recommitted to her, I've made a huge mistake. Michael decided to do the noble thing and let her go. As Marta develops feelings for Michael, she's overheard expressing them to her mother by Job. She kept using this guy's name, like, Hermano. Spanish speakers are probably ahead of the joke on this one. Mi hermano. Brother. I've made a huge mistake. Job and Michael come to blows in the following episode. Eventually, Marta becomes a real character, realizing the Bluths are awful. I, I thought you care about family, but you clearly don't. It's over. Both of you. It's over. This rejection brings the two together until we see them at each other's throats over who gets to run the company. Joe charged at Michael with the scissors, but Michael, as he always did, picked rock. You wanted to make me look foolish. with scissors. Which beat scissors. Throughout this stretch of episodes in the first half of season one, there's very little that Marta does except play the dutiful and eventually conflicted girlfriend. It's hard to understand what she ever saw in Job, and that a few gestures from Michael sweep her off her feet make her seem as though this is a woman who is a successful actress, by the way, who has had some underwhelming experiences with romance. What it also reveals is that she's more of a prop being passed around so we can learn more about the relationship between Michael and Job. That this eventually gets replaced by who gets to be in charge of the company reveals that their rivalry is a product of their own bitter feelings towards one another. And also how inconsequential Marta was as a character. The joke about confusing the word hermano for a name also reveals just how horribly self-absorbed these characters are. It's a word that should come very easily to anyone with a Spanish-speaking girlfriend, but Job is completely oblivious, and Michael, for as charmed as he supposedly is by Marta, can't be bothered to learn the language she speaks, although he does sort of try. Are you going to the complimentary breakfast? That'll get her hot. Michael and Job's rivalry isn't the only dynamic we see in these early episodes, though. We also get a glimpse of the grotesque as we learn about the relationship between Buster and Lucille. 
She's always got to wedge herself in the middle of us so that she can control everything. Yeah. <laughs> Mom's awesome. Third Dynamic is created by Lucille's need to be needed, and Buster is the one paying the price for that need. Buster breaks away from his mother by becoming romantically involved with Lucille's best friend and rival, Lucille Ostero. And Buster showed up just in time. Ten thousand dollars! Buster! To bid on the wrong Lucille. While this gesture from Buster wasn't entirely intentional, he was supposed to be bidding on his mother, Buster and Lucille too do develop their own strange dynamic. Our relationship doesn't work? No, not as long as you keep getting me all mixed up with your mother. It is exactly the opposite. I'm leaving my mother for you. You're replacing my mother. Lucille fights back by replacing Buster with a boy adopted from Korea, Anyang. Look, I'm gone for a couple days and you find a new son? Lucille could see that her son was concerned, even jealous and she knew how it felt to be overlooked. Yes. Anyang is your brother now. Anyang. Yes, Anyang. Anyang is the Korean word for hello. The parallel here between Anyang and Marta is pretty clear. They're both pawns in the game the Blue family is playing. Marked that way by not only being outside the family, but outside the broader cultural context the Blues find themselves in. In contrast, Lucille too is a far more developed character, because she lives in that white, upper-class world. The world this series is giving us a glimpse into. It reveals the general disinterest these people have for those who are outside their bubble, aside from using them as tools in the conflicts they have between one another. Even though Anyang hangs around until the end of the series, the number of appearances he makes dwindles as time goes on, and his role in the finale is more of a bit part for a character who is ostensibly part of the Bluth family. In that way, along with basically reusing the same joke about the Bluths not understanding a word spoken in another language, the show reveals itself to be part of that same world as the Bluths, concerned with the Bluth family, but not so much with the people they step on. They're just there to prove a point. The Bluth siblings are very much aware of how their parents have messed up their lives. They even bond with Buster when he dares to criticize their mother. I'm mom and I want to shoot down everything you say so I feel good about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Look who's ragging on the old lady! Hey! Because hey. I'm an uptight <laughs> Buster! <laughs> you old horny slut! Well, no one's gonna top that. Lucille Bluth is not likely to win Mother of the Year. In the first season, she even attempts to pin a car accident that was absolutely her fault on Michael. The original premise of the series was a family alienated from one another by its wealth, learning how to get along. While the first half of that statement is present, the second half never quite comes to fruition. They're more a family stuck together sharing their misery, and Lucille is the perfect representative of that. Lucille is completely out of touch with the world outside of her wealthy socialite bubble. I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? Ten dollars? While lines like that reveal Lucille's detachment from the wider world, her relationship with her children is similarly detached, held together not through love, but through manipulation. I just want my children to love me. Stop lying. Stop manipulating. Just be nicer. I'm a horrible mother. No, no, Ma, That's you're crazy. That's crazy, Todd. You're a fantastic mother. Oh, George Sr. isn't a whole lot better. While he may be in jail for most of the first season, his brief trips out of prison reveal someone less interested in the welfare of his family and more about keeping himself from being locked up for good. George Sr. is a patriarch in many senses of the word, head of the family, head of the company, and he literally portrays God in one episode. Although when he uses that opportunity to make his escape, the episode very cutely reveals that this is a world where you can't trust in even a heavenly father. Where is God? There is no God! George Sr. and Lucille are, quite clearly, awful parents, and the show is very clear to present them as two people not to be trusted. And more than just bad parents, they represent authority and status more broadly, being wealthy and running the Bluth Company. George Sr. as a boss is tough to get a grasp on since he's arrested in the first episode of the series, but the culture created at the Bluth Company is one set up for a domineering boss to control his employees the way a domineering father controls his children. For example, using former employee J. Walter Weatherman, played by Steve Ryan, to teach his kids lessons. If someone had left a 
enough to know this this innocent man would still have his arm wide. And that's why you always leave a note. When the younger Bluth step into positions of authority, rather than commiserating with the workers, knowing what it's like for George Sr. and Lucille to treat them like children, they instead adopt the role of their parents. When Michael takes charge of the company, he leads his employees around like sheep. I told you, these people are sheep, alright? And they'll wander off and you'll lose the sheep. You've lost the sheep. The Bluths also have family discussions in front of them, as if they aren't even there. So, uh, can we go now? Job even organizes the workers not to improve their conditions, but instead to undermine Michael as the one in charge. You got paid? I thought we were all making sacrifices. Yeah, well, maybe it's time for some of those big shots of the Bluth Company to start making some sacrifices. I say we shut down construction! And going back to Michael, even though he's presented as the responsible one, he expects his workers to work without getting paid, something that reveals a deep level of disrespect, even from the normal Bluth. In spite of whatever hardships the Bluths place on one another, they still adhere to their social standing, even when those hardships should be teaching them another lesson entirely. What they learn is to not stand in solidarity with the oppressed, but to claim their birthright as oppressors. Early in the season, Michael discovers a truth about his father. And I may have committed some uh, light treason. Michael knew his father was guilty of something, but he had no idea it was this bad. And that's another recurring theme of this series, people who seem bad being revealed as even worse. One late addition in season one was George Sr.'s identical twin brother, Oscar George Bluth. The introduction of Oscar came about because creator Mitch Hurwitz happened to see Jeffrey Tambor in a wig, and he thought it looked interesting. So Oscar was written into the show, giving Tambor two reoccurring characters to play, which is a pretty big step up from initially being cast to a single episode guest role. The reason the Bluth Company looms so heavily over the family, defining their relationships and shaping their goals, is in part because aside from Michael, none of them have a sense for business. For your information, I got a job. Really? What kind of job? Beads. Bees? Beads. Beads? Job's not on board. This is a family that has largely lived off the largesse of the unethical George Sr., never having to consider what living in the real world means. Throughout season one, we see how this dynamic has created a family unable to do more than occasionally band together against an outside threat. The rest of the time, they spend bickering and plotting against each other to take control of the company out of fear that this loss of power will mean they will have to know what it feels like to not be rich. Tell me the truth, okay? Because there's been a lot of lying in this family. And a lot of love. More lies. Family isn't there for love or comfort, so much as they're there to help make you money. This is shown very clearly in this episode where it's revealed that George Sr. monetized the rivalry between Job and Michael in a series of tapes called Boy Fights. And more than the alienation caused by their wealth, we see how the Bluth Company is so concerned with making money that they're willing to deal with a dictator like Saddam Hussein. These homes appear to be American-built to begin with. There have been sanctions against doing business with Hussein's regime since the early 90s, so who built them? Does that look a little like our kitchen island? Well, whoever it is, they're in a world of trouble. According and Michael to realized sources, that his father's crimes might be bigger than he thought. Wealth and the pursuit of it has shattered every part of the lives of the Blue family. They don't trust one another, they live in deluded fantasies about themselves, and they've created a company whose workers have been conditioned to behave like children. In short, the Bluths represent everything bad about a society fueled by greed, living in a twisted version of the American greed that creates parodies of families as a means to financial gain. It's almost mocking any workplace where a boss will come in and tell everyone, we're like a family. Except it's a family where a father controls all the children and takes most of the money for himself. In the season finale, Michael once again wants to leave his family, only for circumstances to convince him to stay. With his trial still some time away, George Sr. seemingly has a heart attack and is hospitalized. We lost him. He <gasps> just uh, got away from us, I'm sorry. Uh, can we go in there? <gasps> if you want, not a lot to see. I mean, not for you, but for us. And that's when the family realized that George Sr. wasn't dead, but was fleeing the country that he loved so very much. Pack your bags. 
This is a nice setup for the next season, which is as good a segue as any to talk about another unique trait of the series, the previews for the next episode. The family grapples with the news they had just heard. Why would a doctor say he's gone when he means he's escaped? What was especially fun about these is they almost never appeared in the next episode. Rather, they were fun jokes for an episode to end on, playing on whatever happened in the episode itself. These were originally added because Mitch Hurwitz wanted to get test audiences to say they wanted to see what would happen on the next episode. These previews also reveal a loose relationship with continuity, something the series would be less comfortable with as time went on. Look at me getting off. The first season of Arrested Development was about establishing its style and tone. It demanded much of viewers to follow plot lines and jokes through many twists and turns, all to arrive at the core of a series that had a basic message of how wealth can poison a family. It was a very new way of presenting an old message, and it was that pairing of a new style and familiar message that won the attention of critics. Here's an example of a review of the first episode from a writer at the New York Times shortly before the show premiered. The Bluth heirs are eccentric and warped, but they are not hothouse child prodigies like the Tenenbaum siblings. They are nouveau riche misfits, the Ewings of Dallas as seen by Buñuel, and they are quite amusing. As the year went on, critics became increasingly enamored with the show. At the TV Land Awards, it won the Future Classic Award. It wasn't the best predictor for classic television. For every year in which it would go to a massive hit like The Office, there would be other years where it would go to flash in the pans like Heroes. That said, the award meant enough to Arrested Development that the acceptance speech made it on to the first season DVD release of the show. This sentiment would be carried by critics all the way into the Emmys, where Arrested Development was nominated for four awards and won three. Mitch Hurwitz won for writing in a comedy series, the Russo brothers won for directing in a comedy series, and the show itself won Best Comedy Series, beating out the likes of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Everybody Loves Raymond, Sex and the City, and Will and Grace. Special attention should be given to how Hurwitz ended his acceptance speech for Best Comedy Series. Let's watch it. You want it? Saying, let's watch it, was a reminder that, in this absolute love bomb of critical praise from the TV critics, very few people were actually watching the show, a sentiment that can be seen during interviews at the time. My dream has always been to work on a show, regardless of what that show is, that holds Malcolm's numbers. And... <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't happen, you move on. You move on. <laughs> So just how bad were the ratings? While the first episode debuted to just under 8 million viewers, by the end of the first season, it was down to less than 6. Its average for the year was 6.2 million viewers. Its lead-in, Malcolm in the Middle, while not a ratings juggernaut, was still doing significantly better beginning the season with 10 million viewers, ending with 8 million viewers, and having an average of 8.35 million viewers. There was a small uptick in the ratings on March 17th when the show was given the coveted spot following American Idol, giving the show its highest rating ever with 9.6 million viewers. But even though this one episode was moved to the middle of the week for a one-off attempt to garner a new audience, it ended up losing nearly 60% of the people who are watching American Idol. And looking at ratings for the following weeks, it seems none of that 3 million audience surplus seemed to follow Arrested Development back to its Sunday night time slot. Aside from Cops, Arrested Development was the lowest rated show on Fox not to get cancelled. In overall viewing numbers, it was ranked 105th. Things weren't looking good ratings-wise. In an article from Entertainment Weekly, some concerns were expressed by the network. Fox Entertainment President Gail Berman admits Arrested Development's numbers are troubling. Still, she insists the network isn't abandoning hope. Yet. Look. I love this show, she says. We're trying to figure out every possible way we can help it. Hurwitz, in interviews years later, expressed that he believed the network was considering cancelling the show, but only relented after all of the critical acclaim, particularly because of the awards it was winning. Therefore, they felt like they had to keep it on the air. By winning the Emmy for Best Comedy Series, along with two others, it was hoped that these successes would turn things around for the series, giving it a bigger profile, attracting a wider audience, and telling a huge comeback story. They didn't, but it would have been. Season 2 opens with Michael heading back to the family because he isn't sure they really got how serious he was about leaving. I think we're still there. We're going back. 
Michael is once again trapped with his family, only now he's implicated in George Sr.'s dealings with Saddam Hussein, and the evidence he needs to clear himself is stolen by George Sr., effectively throwing his own son under the bus to save himself. He's not a great dad. George Sr.'s ties to Saddam Hussein, revealing the interest of private business in earning a profit over national security, is just one of many political observations made throughout the series. In the same episode, we see Buster enlist into the army by Lucille when she's confronted by a legally distinct version of Michael Moore. Would you enlist your son or daughter in the army? Yes. Although Lucille would later regret it, it does underscore the desperation of the US military if they're willing to accept a guy like Buster into their ranks. As the next two seasons progress, the political commentary gets increasingly obvious. The Patriot Act, a controversial piece of post-9-11 legislation that gave the US government greater surveillance power, is mocked when it's used to obtain a photo of bunkers with weapons of mass destruction, not realizing that this photo is actually of Tobias's balls. Those are the pictures? They're all over the news. Those are balls. George Sr. is found in a hole similar to the one Saddam Hussein was hiding in, and at one point he records a video that very much presents him looking like Osama bin Laden. The Bluths even find themselves in Iraq, meeting Saddam Hussein impersonators living in the Iraqi version of the model home, complete with what appears to be a weapon of mass destruction. I haven't even mentioned references to the cut and run talking point, the George W. Bush mission accomplished photo op, the Rumsfeld photo parody, and so many more. Arrested Development was diving into political comedy in a way no other sitcom at the time was. Towards the end of the third season, we also learn that George Sr. has secretly been working with the US government this whole time. Did we bug a house in Mamoon? Yeah, we got some guy named George Bluth to build houses down there so we could wire them. The Bluths are portrayed as entrenched in the government establishment and are also working with Saddam Hussein. Although Hussein's reign wasn't welcomed by the United States when it began, his war with Iran did make him a temporary ally, an uneasy partnership that went south when Iraq went on to invade Kuwait. The Bluths represent the capriciousness of these relationships, dependent on economic ties, as oil can be traced to the root of many of these real-world conflicts. Although Arrested Development was more concerned with showing how incredibly silly all of this was, it also revealed a cynicism towards American foreign policy that was rarely seen in the immediate post-9-11 era. It's a sharp rebuke of the unthinking patriotism that you often saw on TV shows, instead opting to portray how the American government and big businesses are happy to collude with supposed enemies if it meant keeping the price of oil down. Another big part of this series is the increasingly sour relationship between Tobias and Lindsay. As you may or may not know, Lindsay and I have hit a bit of a rough patch. Really? When did that start? Well, I don't want to blame it all on 9-11, but... We get a hint of why their marriage is failing in the first episode of the series. You're gay. No, no. no I'm, not, I'm not gay. No, Lindsay, how many times must we have this? No. Assumptions about Tobias's sexuality come up again many times throughout the series' run, usually because of his unusual choice of words. I'm afraid I just blew myself. Even if it means me taking a chubby, I will suck it up. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, I've been in the film business for a while, but I just can't seem to get one in the can. Out of context. I wouldn't mind kissing that man between the cheeks, so to speak. And he realizes there is something distinct about the way he speaks. Tobias. You blow hard. <laughs> the irony here being that Tobias, as a trained analyst and therapist, isn't able to infer some deeper meaning behind the unusual way he speaks. You have to be some sort of she hope to get this. Just gotta really dig. Tobias actively rejecting expectations of his gender leads people to suspect he may be gay, or the fact that he's a never nude, which means he can never go anywhere without wearing a pair of cutoffs and that he often uses female pronouns when drawing analogies to himself, may even suggest that he's trans. In her essay on the character, Darcy Dahl, an assistant professor of philosophy at Delta College, describes how the real lesson here is to not treat Tobias's sexuality or gender identity as some kind of guessing game, but instead reflect on what that says about the expectations we place on people. She writes, what a person like Tobias shows us is that we needn't concern ourselves with fitting into a specific mold. We need not worry about whether we're too feminine or masculine, nor about whether our sexuality or personality conforms to normal standards. Perhaps we should all try to find the Tobias inside of us. 
While there are plenty of things in Tobias we can find fault with, such as his neglect of his daughter, his inability to leave a doomed marriage, or his ridiculous attempts to try and become an actor, when it comes to his sexuality or gender, he doesn't seem to be distressed by it. So how is it anyone else's business? And if he does have some kind of deep internal conflicts, instead of telling him what those are, what he needs is a loving, caring space to explore those feelings himself and find his own way through them, which, again, is something he may not even need. It's also something he'll never find in the Blue family. Lindsay struggles to find a life outside of her marriage, with Tobias being asked to leave the model home. Like what you see? I've been looking for those. You're gonna stretch them out. That's all you can say? Well, excuse me for liking the way they shape my junk. I don't know why, but that's it. You can pack your junk and get out. And Tobias has to worm his way back in by posing as a British nanny named Mrs. Featherbottom. Who'd like a banger in the mouth? Oh, right, I forgot. Here in the States, you call it a sausage in the mouth. We just call it a sausage. Although Lindsay assumes Tobias is doing this because he misses maybe, the truth is neither she nor Tobias are very concerned with the happenings of their daughter. The Funke family is crumbling because of Tobias is nursing this ridiculous dream about becoming a doctor, and Lindsay is trying to maintain her life as a philanthropist while dating outside her marriage, and they're each living off of the fumes of the family fortune, doing nothing to adapt to their new circumstances. They're so clueless that they're not even sure their marriage is over or not. Maybe the fact that we don't know if we're together or not is a sign that we should split again. Or stay split up. Okay, forget about Vegas. We'll stay here and get back together. This reveals the level of rot that sets in the minds of people living off of fabulous wealth, particularly when they had nothing to do with its creation. Tobias and Lindsay have spent much of their adult lives living off their whims especially Lindsay's whim to become married to Tobias. It's a reflection of a life lived without consequences for those whims, and maybe is left out in the cold. Born into a family that barely pays attention to her. Luckily for her, she manages to connive her way into becoming a teenage movie executive. What are you, like 15? Marry me. Everyone thinks I look young too. These two seasons also saw a number of changes for Buster. After joining the army, he lost his hand to a dangerous seal attack. And then a seal bites off his hand. He's going to be all right. Oh, oh thank God. Finally, some good news There's from no this other guy. way to take that. Yes, he's lost his left hand, so he's going to be all right. You what son of a bitch! I hate oh, this on, doctor! We also learn that Buster's father may not be George Sr. You're the one who says I need a father figure. Yes, a father figure. Do you know what I went through to have this boy? Oh, I know where the boy came from. Yes, and she's not having an affair with the boy's uncle. A key part of Buster's story is this bizarre moment where Lucille is confronted. Jean? It's just some idiot with balloons. Oh, is it? Ah, I knew it! Oh, this guy always gets me. Although George Michael's crush on his cousin was firmly established in season one, over time we see him develop a new interest in Anne Veal. Her? Michael isn't a fan. Although much of the series establishes he finds her bland and uninteresting, there is another side to his lack of an appreciation. You spend all your time with her. It's like you're hogging her. Like you're a little Anne hog, okay? Don't be such an Anne hog. There's something particularly gross about a grown man making jokes about a teenage girl's weight. And even though Mae Whitman, for many of her scenes, is wearing a fat suit, or at least the hips of a fat suit, according to the actress, she just doesn't seem particularly overweight. It's a strange focal point for Michael and reveals him to be not quite the nice guy he tries to present himself as. It's a subtle reminder that there are no good bluths in this show. Even while he's romancing Anne, George Michael still has an attraction to his cousin. When the two of them kiss in the season two finale, the model home literally sinks. And that's when George Michael finally got close to Maybe, who, by the way, might not be his biological cousin. And while this gets awkwardly ignored in season three, we do get some closure for the George Michael relationship with Anne. She dumps him. I met a man. George Michael was devastated. The third season did show us a relationship blossoming, though, and it's perhaps the most controversial one in the series, Michael's relationship with Rita Leeds, played by Charlize Theron. Let's just jump right to a fact that the series takes several episodes to reveal. Rita has a mental health condition that is unfortunately revealed through the use of an ableist slur. 
Michael is unable to notice for several episodes because she's British and incredibly beautiful, so he assumes she's being quirky. When he proposes and nearly has sex with her, he only stops after learning the truth, and then he ends things with Rita. You found out. Took me long enough. Maybe you're not smart either. I didn't know until they told me. No, I'm just a narcissist who is too self-involved to see the truth. This half-season arc has gotten some critical attention over the years, though aside from the use of a certain word and the childlike innocence archetype Rita is slotted into, the series does make an effort to create a more well-rounded character who has wants and desires of her own. It's a level of depth we didn't get to see for other love interests of Michael, such as Marta. Although it's worth mentioning that Rita is fabulously wealthy, putting her in a closer social standing to the Bluths than someone like Marta. Being white and British, I'm sure helps as well. One thing Arrested Development does that's unlike a lot of other shows is including a number of characters with disabilities, visible or otherwise. Even members of the principal cast have disabilities, such as Tobias being a never-nude and Buster losing his hand. Well, in the case of Buster, laughing at him for losing a hand and treating him like a machine can seem a bit cruel, and Tobias being a never-nude is just a punchline. The show's record on characters with disabilities does become more complex when looking at the supporting cast. For Slate, Inku Kang wrote, It's hard to think of another series that features so many different kinds of disabilities while ensuring that the people with those syndromes are more than their impairments. In fact, they are, with a single glaring exception, just like the rest of the show's version of Orange County. Vain, vindictive, pompous, dishonest, opportunistic, and or oblivious. These characters fit so seamlessly into the rest of the show's universe that they silently expose how cloying and or exoticizing Hollywood's usual stereotypes about people with disabilities are. Inspirational, asexual, tragic, brilliant, or superpowered, a victim or a villain. Their impairments poised to be overcome. One of the major through lines in the series is the impact between generations within a family. And this can be seen in one of the key relationships between a father and son. Michael and his son, George Michael. Michael is determined to raise his son in a loving way that his father hadn't for him. In the show's second episode, we see how Michael does that when he confers the important responsibility of running the family banana stand on George Michael. Don't look at me, Mr. Manager. Right, it's up to me now. I'm Mr. Manager. Manager, we, we, we just say... Uh, I know, but you just... Doesn't matter who. The subtle joke here is that Michael is denying his son the adult Mr. title, not letting him grow up. A key part of their relationship. The two Bluth boys struggle to communicate with one another, and while Michael remembers his father being a controlling tyrant, he exercises his own brand of control over George Michael. I'll work weeknights, I'll lay people off, I'll give up my summer, all my summers, just, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Michael realized he had done to his son what his father had done to him. Michael doesn't want to be like his father, but the way he's raised George Michael is a lot like the way George Sr. raised him, such as getting them to be incredibly hard on themselves. Why, no, you stupid jerk. Why not? Dumb. Dumb. Dumb George Michael. Dumb. Whoa, dumb. whoa, whoa. Calm down, you two. It's just a math problem. Well, yeah, but if I fail math, there goes my chance at a good job and a happy life full of hard work, like you always say. I know, I know, but it's my fault. I've been pushing him too hard. It's just dumb, 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 Michael, hey, hey, dumb. Shh, shh, shh. I forgive you. The intergenerational impact of bad parenting is felt throughout the series. It's this relationship that carries the heart of the series in the early seasons, and would be one major thing to keep in mind for the fourth season, though that wouldn't be coming for another eight years. Fox finally pulled the plug on Arrested Development, with its third season order being cut to a lean 13 episodes, the final four bearing in opposition to the Winter Olympics. The series did make several attempts to appeal to a wider audience, though they never quite resonated. The second season also used some very heavy-handed product placement to earn some goodwill and extra ad revenue for the network. I'm trying to get them to underwrite a new TV project I'm working on, get some money in exchange for setting a scene here in Burger King. Well, as long as you don't draw attention to it. In the third season, after learning the show was being cancelled, a special Save Our Bluths themed episode titled SOBs parodied every stunt that shows used to goose the ratings, from guest stars to shots in 3D. We're gonna have to pull out all the stops. What am I talking about? I'm talking about all of you getting jobs. Now the best place to look oh, oh. Who threw the tomato? At one point they even resorted to begging. It's just hard to accept that it's really come to begging. Sometimes it's the only way to stay in the game. 
Please tell your friends about this show. When this episode aired, the writing was more or less on the wall. Fox would no longer be a home for Arrested Development, and the show even made coy remarks about the future of the show. So what's going on with the fundraiser? Well, uh, I don't think the Home Builders organization is going to be supporting us. Yeah, the HBO is not going to want us. What do we do now? Well, I think it's showtime. I think we have to have a show during dinner. At one point, we see the show contrast its own brand of complex characters with other TV sitcoms. You didn't ask me if I wanted to go to the school. You didn't ask me about what I said. You threatened my teacher. You don't respect me. How can I respect you, man? It was a complex situation without an easy solution. Hello? The caterers didn't show up. I've got 50 people coming in three hours and nothing to feed them. No one to serve it. We have to make a good impression or we're finished. Now that's a clear-cut situation with the promise of comedy. Tell your friends. It's almost defensive in how firmly the show asserts itself as something transgressive in the sitcom space. And at the time, there was some truth to that. There was an abundance of mediocre sitcoms on the air, using tired yet familiar gags to attract audiences looking for something comfortable. But it wasn't as if other genre-defying shows weren't finding success. And blaming the audience isn't always the best bet. Michael himself acknowledges this when he says, what has happened to us is a great injustice, that we were never really given a fair chance. But that's not the truth. We've been given plenty of chances. And maybe the Bluths just aren't worth saving. Maybe we're not that likable. In the season three finale, Development Arrested, we find the Bluths once again on a boat, much in the way the series began. George Sr. is free, and we learn Lucille was the real brains behind the Bluth company. And Lindsay finds out she's adopted. I'm adopted. I'm sorry, I thought you knew. Have I upset you? Are you kidding me? This is the happiest I've been since the day I got my new nose! Sharp-eyed viewers also noticed a subtle reference to the show's strong sales on DVD. Other bombshells include learning that Anne is dating Job, who then gets punched in the face by George Michael, and Michael realizes he succeeded in his mission. I made a choice to keep this family together. And that's when Michael finally cried. Uh, today looks like I succeeded. It wasn't exactly a turn on. When Michael realizes his son is hurting after learning about Job's betrayal, he wants to comfort him. And he learns something important when Lucille tries to stop him. Mom, this is important, okay? Michael, this company is important. It was at that moment that Michael realized how much he'd sold out. As Michael runs off to be with his son, Lucille sells the company to Stan Sitwell in a panic, as Anyang is revealed to have betrayed the Bluths. What the hell did you do this for? Because my grandfather vowed one day he would get even for banana sand you stole from him. And the show ends on the crucial relationship. Let's say we give them no choice but to keep themselves all together for a while. It was arrested development. And the epilogue gives us one last gasp of hope. And maybe pitches her TV show to a Hollywood icon who says, No, I, uh, I don't see it as a series. Maybe a movie. And so ends the first three seasons of Arrested Development, hitting the important beats of how families and businesses should be kept distinct, the sinister relationship between the American government and the business world, and that wealth can rot the connections within a family. But it's hard to focus on the themes of the show with all the loud raging over its untimely cancellation. Although there were brief flashes of self-awareness, such as the few words from Michael in the SOB episode, most of the time this was a show that was clearly kicking and screaming as it went off the air. Not that it didn't have some ground for that, but it does complicate a reading of it. The text becomes less about the characters and their antics, and more about the context the show found itself in. While the curtain was coming down on the show for now, with some of its lowest ratings, thanks to the love of critics and a passionate fan base, it wouldn't be quickly forgotten. I wasn't yet OS. Overtly sexual. sexual. Right. Upon entering its second season, ratings for Arrested Development weren't really helped by its Emmy wins. It didn't do any worse, but it didn't do a whole lot better either. The second season averaged 5.9 million viewers per episode, only slightly down from season 1's 6.2 million. Although ratings remained low, the show surprisingly got picked up for a third season. In an Entertainment Weekly article, Peter Liguori, the new Fox broadcasting president of entertainment, said in a statement, Arrested Development is one of the best comedies on television. The decision to order another season becomes easy when you consider its amazing cast, creative brilliance, critical acclaim, and advertiser appeal. It's my first official pickup since taking the job, and I think it's a great way to start. 
One change was the show being moved from Sunday nights at 9.30 to Monday nights at 8. It fared even worse than the ratings. The third season would go on to average 3.9 million viewers, losing 2 million from the previous season. Albeit, that does include four episodes that were aired directly against the Olympics, dragging down the overall average. The low ratings hurt morale on the show, and that was likely made worse when the full season was cut down to a 13-episode half-season. Although Mitch Hurwitz was in talks to bring the series to Showtime for a fourth season, ultimately these negotiations fell through. Part of the reason, as Hurwitz would later explain, was because of his own fatigue running such a detailed series. In an interview, he said, In truth, I had taken it as far as I felt I could as a series. I told the story I wanted to tell, and we were getting to a point where I think a lot of the actors were ready to move on. My first instinct was that it was over when Fox pulled the plug. I considered continuing the show because I felt I owed that to the fans, but I am determined to give them some other kind of entertainment that will satisfy them at some point, I hope. Even though Arrested Development had a record low viewership, the main demographic appears to have been movie studio executives, so hopefully the cast will be able to benefit from that. Even if the show had been picked up for a fourth season, Horowitz expressed that he likely would have taken a backseat role, unable to keep up the pace of running a show that was built on so many small details. The third season in particular seems to have really demotivated him and everyone working on the show because of a lack of faith in how it was presented and promoted by the network. Although the audience for Arrested Development was small, they were particularly passionate, and when it came time to point fingers, many of them were directed at Fox. This wasn't entirely spontaneous, though. In the same way the Instant Classic label was encouraged by the DVD release of the first season, the second season's DVD set had a message of its own buried at the end of the season 2 blooper reel featurette. I got an idea for what you can do. What? Why don't you f fire your complete marketing team, all right? Get a new one in there, knows how to market a uh, show that won five mother... Emmys, Golden Globes, SAG Awards, WGA Awards, DGA Awards, Producers Guild Awards, Critics Top Ten lists. You know, if you can, if you can't market that kind of show and get better ratings, then maybe the problem doesn't lie here. Maybe it lies with marketing. Good night. Good night, thank you very much. David Cross's frustration at the network was a pivotal moment, and really shaped the perception of why the show failed. It was moved to different time slots, it wasn't advertised the right way, or the network simply didn't believe in it. Looking at the evidence, not all of that is true. The show had a very stable time slot, aside from that one episode in the first season that was placed after an episode of American Idol, and the final four episodes being programmed against the Olympics, which was decided well after the show had been cancelled. It often didn't air new episodes on consecutive weeks, but the same was true for other shows on the same night, which tended to perform better. To say the network simply didn't believe in the show is a bit of a stretch when it ran for two and a half seasons, with ratings that would get most other shows cancelled in less than half that amount of time. None of that is to say the network is blameless, though. Arrested Development is a hard show to sell, but Fox was unable to capitalize on its acclaim and loyal fan base to reach a wider audience. A brilliant show doesn't naturally find an audience if a network isn't entirely sure how to find that audience. In 2011, Mitch Hurwitz wrote an article for The Guardian titled, Arrested Development Creator Mitch Hurwitz's Guide to Getting a Sitcom Cancelled. In it, he has some unflinching reflections on why the show failed to connect to audiences. Here are a few examples. Try to do too much for a 20-minute program. If in your particular medium an audience is used to a simple plot line or maybe one or two stories, see if you can get eight in there, and find a way that they somehow intertwine. Add a sprinkle of incest. They'll never admit it, but viewers love sex. In fact, they love any sort of titillation, with the exception of incest, so focus on that. First impressions are everything, so if you can screw that up, you're made. With Arrested Development, we tried showing the deep disdain that connects a family. We wanted to hold up a mirror to American society, and just as predicted, America looked away. Make easy jokes about minority groups, whether they be Mexicans, Jews, or homosexuals. Any group can be dismissed with a few stereotypical cracks. At least, that's what we tried to do. And given their lack of coming to the party, it seems we succeeded. That last point in particular is worth considering, as there is a distinction to think about when it comes to edgy humor. While Arrest Development did have a few tasteless jokes about certain identity groups, sometimes being outright racist, it typically had even more jokes about the oblivious Bluths and their racist attitudes. In many cases, the Bluths were the butt of the racially charged jokes. For example, when Job brings out his racist puppet Franklin, the joke here is that Job is a racist. Let me give that oatmeal some brown sugar. Oh, my wife, you bastard! Oh, man, what's the matter with Franklin you? said some things Whitey just wasn't ready to hear. The episode even makes a decent bit of racial commentary. 
The police had been delayed when they thought they'd cornered a kidnapping suspect. Put your hands up or we'll take that as a sign of aggression against us. They're not up! He's aggressive! So maybe not all the racial humor on the show was offensive, but a question worth asking is, even if something isn't offensive, is it something someone from one of these groups would actually want to watch? Perhaps more than the racism, rather it's that a show centered around a rich white family gets less interesting the further the audience gets away from that experience. There are plenty of examples of shows ahead of their time that had weak first seasons, only to catch on sometime later. Cheers was one of the lowest rated shows on network TV when it aired. Seinfeld went from a solid performer to one of the highest rated shows on television. But those were shows that began in the 80s, and Arrested Development began in 2003. The realities of network television were changing, with more channels to compete against and more people DVRing shows. It was tougher for a niche show to get a chance to grow, because audiences were fragmenting. There was one unique advantage Arrested Development had being in the mid-2000, and that's the benefit of DVD sales. Although it's tough to find hard numbers, sales for Arrested Development DVDs were quoted as being somewhere around 3 million units sold in the United States in an article that was published in 2013. The Numbers, a website that estimates the sales of media, claims that the third season of Arrested Development sold roughly 400,000 units in its first three weeks. With an audience of under 4 million, that's a very high conversion rate of people buying DVDs. While these numbers would be dwarfed by powerhouses in the TV DVD space, such as Family Guy, it was still a sign that, at the very least, Arrested Development had a dedicated enough fan base not to let this show vanish into the night. Fried cheese with club sauce. In the years between Arrested Development's cancellation and return, the series was kept alive in the minds of the public with rumors of a supposed movie being in the works. The cast and creative team would, on occasion, stoke those rumors, but a lot of it was driven by a fanbase hungry for more Arrested Development. Writing for The Verge, Keith Phipps offers some insight into this time. Here's some inside baseball. If you worked at a pop culture website between 2006 and 2013, running items about Arrested Development's long-rumored return was like printing page views. In addition to having a voracious fan base, Arrested Development was also fortunate to have critics in position of influence to ensure that the series was held in high regard, frequently placing it on lists of the all-time greatest TV shows. This period is what started to cement the idea of Arrested Development being canonized as one of the all-time TV greats. It was unique, daring, and cancelled before its time, everything to make it a darling, and its reputation was helping it find a wider audience even off the air. In TV history, shows that are considered all-time classics are often those that drew a massive audience, but a space has always been carved out for smaller shows that were cancelled before their time, usually because they were very influential. That space is reserved for shows that are not remembered by a mass audience, but rather critics or a passionate fan base that keep it from being forgotten. Historically, this is closer to how other forms of art are remembered. Although popularity is a helpful boost, a mass audience tends to move on from a work of art as time goes on so it falls to critics, academics, and the most passionate appreciators of a field of art to preserve its memory. With television, things become more complicated. It's rare for any long-running TV series to have its best episodes or moments in the first season or two. Oftentimes, shows will find that their third, fourth, or fifth seasons are among their strongest. But it could only get there if it could build on a base of popular support. This is why popularity is always important to consider when thinking of the all-time TV greats. A movie, a song, or a book is a finished product and is going to reach the highest potential it can, but a show that keeps running has room to grow and improve. This makes Arrested Development's accomplishment of becoming considered a classic so quickly even more impressive. Throughout the years following the cancellation of the show, fan sites started popping up online, including the Balboa Observer, the Inconvenient Bluth, and the Banana Stand. Fan sites in particular were a fitting homage, as the show itself was constantly putting together mock websites that were briefly mentioned on an episode. The series itself almost seems built for internet fandom, as part of the fun involved diving into each episode, finding foreshadowing for future events, like a vague reference to a dangerous seal attacking people several episodes before it would bite off Buster's hand. And a seal attack, oh. meet one surprised bather coming up. Or a guy who bears a striking resemblance to one of Saddam Hussein's sons appearing at a Bluth Company event. Was that Kusei Hussein at the omelet bar? All these little details became catnip for a fan base that was all too happy to dissect them. In many ways, this has even influenced how other fandoms have deconstructed shows on the internet, hyperfixating on every detail in a trailer or an episode, trying to connect various narrative strands. While Arrested Development fans certainly didn't invent this way of looking at media, they did help popularize it on the internet. 
There is a downside to this, though. It's helped give us an online culture that is less inclined to discuss the themes or experiences of watching something to instead try and find any small detail that appears more than once and calling it a day. While no specific way of watching a TV show is correct or better than the other, I personally appreciate a more balanced approach. It's fun to find Easter eggs, but I think it's fun to do something with those eggs to shape one's understanding of what a show is trying to say. The series even inspired fans to create a documentary that included interviews with cast members and other people involved with the production of the series. It also interviewed a number of fans, all expressing their undying love for the series. After what seemed like an endless series of teases, eventually it was revealed that Arrested Development was coming back from the land of dead TV shows. It was what fans thought was a dream come true. On October 2nd, 2011, the cast of Arrested Development, along with Ron Howard and Mitch Hurwitz, all gathered for a reunion at the New Yorker Festival. It was here we got the first real indicator that the show would be returning for a limited run. This thing that we've now been pursuing for a while and we're kind of going public with a little bit, we're trying to do kind of a, a, a limited run series into the movie. Um, they're, they're deal things to be worked out, limited but... Limited run TV series. A limited run TV series yeah. that we've been talking about. About six weeks later, it was announced that Netflix would be the new home for this new run of episodes, convinced in part by the show's strong streaming and DVD performance. Rather than renewing the life of the series and continuing to produce new seasons, this was intended to be a standalone season. Netflix CEO Reed Hastings described it saying, Arrested Development is a wildly successful tactic, as opposed to fundamental to the strategy. In August of 2012, a rough date was given for the series' return, spring of 2013. One of the major challenges for the fourth season was that, thanks in no small part to the critical success of the original three seasons, the cast had become very hot commodities. So working out the time to film 10 episodes of a fourth season was a real challenge. Hurwitz decided that instead of trying to recreate the ensemble dynamic of the earlier seasons, he would instead use these episodes to focus on the individual characters, making it easier to film around the schedules of the actors. In fact, this project wasn't even originally intended to be a self-contained fourth season. Rather, the idea was for a series of shorts that would lead to an eventual movie. Hype for the series eventually turned this into a full-blown season, but the movie was always going to be part of the plan. In an interview, Hurwitz said, The master plan is to do these episodes and then do the movie, where the family is all together, and it's very much written and directed in that direction. It all leads to a bigger story. It's kind of the preamble. Although, hopefully it'll be satisfying in its own right. The fourth season was really more of an Act 1 that would hopefully lead into a movie with Acts 2 and 3. Although originally planned to be 10 episodes, with Jason Bateman appearing in all of them, and the rest of the cast being featured in one episode each, the series kept getting larger in the planning stages. Eventually it would grow to 15 episodes. Episodes would still feature a character from the Bluth family, only some characters got two episodes and others only one. Hurwitz was pushed to his limits organizing the series. David Cross, in an interview, describes what it was like visiting Hurwitz's office. You know the murder scene where they go to the psycho killer's apartment and he's got all this crazy s*** mapped out? That's what it looked like. Post-it notes and index cards all across the three walls in this big conference room, yarn stretching from one thing to another and pinned in one place, and then a sharp angular uptick to the Lucille character and down. And then there's a different colored yarn that intersects and weaves in. It took Hurwitz 25 minutes to explain what I was looking at, and I still didn't get everything. When you see that, of course it has to be a TV show. There's no way else to do this. Episodes weren't filmed separately. Rather, multiple scenes were shot each day regardless of the episode they were in. Scripts were rewritten or sometimes only half finished, so many lines were written on the set. In an interview, director Troy Miller said, there's never been a half-hour comedy with the level of complexity here. The idea of how characters interrelate and the episodic arcs in A, B, C, D, and E stories, it's this crazy wormhole he's created. Portia de Rossi describes her experience filming, saying, Look, I had a meltdown, absolutely. Then she laughs. I think all of us as actors had a moment where things came kind of unglued for a second. At one point, I remember I had all the episodes on the floor of my trailer, and they were all open to pages, and I kind of went beautiful mind crazy trying to map everything out. I had arrows and diagrams, and it was so crazy, and then I thought, oh, I just have to let go completely and show up to set and be present. 
As its May 26, 2013 premiere date approached, it was clear that the season wasn't meant to be consumed the way the previous three had been. It was meant to be watched repeatedly with jokes revealing themselves on rewatches and plot lines intersecting in ways people weren't noticing the first time around. Ahead of the release, Mitch Hurwitz offered some advice on watching the season. You can't take it all in at once. It's like the selective attention test. It gives fans something to pour over if that's fun for them. If they want to go right back and check out the Job episode and see how that was set up, they can. Months ahead of the premiere, Netflix started a unique marketing campaign. They began placing fake shows and movies on their platform inspired by previous episodes of Arrested Development. There was also a contest for five fans with the most impressive creations getting a chance to appear in a scene on the show. We also got a fun demo reel for Tobias on his website, insertmeanywhere.biz. Insert me anywhere. Netflix even held an orange carpet premiere to celebrate the release, screening the first two episodes of the season. Leading up to the release, there were a number of times in interviews that Mitch Hurwitz was asked if he had any misgivings about the series potentially tarnishing the legacy of the original three seasons he had created. At this point, Arrested Development had more or less been branded an all-time classic. Hurwitz was always quick to reassure people that this season would not disappoint, and one quote in particular makes it quite clear how the profile had not only grown in the minds of the audience, but also in the mind of the show's creator. Hurwitz said, If the first series aspired to be the godfather in terms of the family, this thing aspires to be a godfather too. I'm sure a lot of people went to see The Godfather Part 2 and said, what happens to the machine guns? What are we doing in Cuba? Meetings? Who cares about meetings? But The Godfather 2 was more substantial and rewatchable. It was more complex. I aspire to do that kind of evolution with this. I don't mean to compare it to The Godfather 2, I just mean that, well, it's not exactly what the audience expects, but I think it'll scratch the itch. Any comparison to The Godfather, even one that was walked back, can come across as a bit of a boast, but at the time, it seemed defensible. Season 4 had some very heavy expectations on its shoulders. It was May. <clears throat> it was May 4th. Fourth season of Arrested Development is so densely layered that even writing about it is a challenge. The first three seasons of the show had smaller story arcs that usually only ran for about half a season, and the only long-term stories were either directly tied to the constant perils of the Bluth Company or ongoing personal concerns like Tobias trying to find an acting job. In other words, they were just reiterating the situation of this situation comedy. Season 4 took things to a much grander scale, with the show's premise changing from a family being held together to one that had been split apart. Each character had their own distinct narrative, only occasionally intersecting with the other characters. And even though the episode count was 15, the actual episodes ran considerably longer, ranging from 29 to 38 minutes. Its total runtime is slightly longer than season 1's, even though that one ran for an additional 7 episodes. Season 4 opens with a tease of where this story will take us, to a night called Cinco de Cuatro. Originally created by the Bluths to undermine the Hispanic festival Cinco de Mayo, only to have Cinco de Cuatro claimed by that same community, and it's the site of the murder of a Lucia Lostero. To unravel how this all happened, the series goes back several years, picking up immediately where Season 3 left off, with the Bluths recovering at a Coast Guard headquarters after having been rescued from sea when Lucille, fleeing the authorities, took the boat that most of the family was on off course. Michael, having discovered at the end of Season 3 that George Sr. had stowed away on the boat he and George Michael were escaping on, also heads back to be reunited with the family. The scene in the Coast Guard headquarters is one of the few that featured all of the Bluth family in the same place at the same time, and it serves as a staging ground for the stories to come. This scene is revisited multiple times throughout the season. Here's how one moment is portrayed across several episodes. Ooh, is that a gal I see? No, it's just a fallacy! It's just a fallacy! Good news, bad news deal. It's just from this scene, each of the characters goes off on their own adventures. Rather than try to follow all the twists and turns of each of them, and there are a lot, instead let's look at what it means for this family to fall apart. One pattern among every member of the family is that their lives all start to break down when they're separated, with no Michael or Bluth company holding them together. All the characters almost immediately begin to self-destruct. Even Michael's new development company quickly fails and he's stuck living in George Michael's dorm, until he's pathetically voted out. With his son as the sole exception, Michael believes he'll be able to find a happier life for himself without his family, and the other Bluths all believe the same thing. 
Tobias's story has him busking on the street dressed up as the Thing from the Fantastic Four. This leads him to getting registered as a sex offender when he pays a visit to Maybe. Is there a little girl here all by herself? And perhaps it was this that would finally get him to admit that he sometimes did speak in a misleading way. Daddy needs to get his rocks off! In Tobias' story, there's a genuinely sweet moment between him and his new friend, Debris Bardot, played by Maria Bamford, a former actress who is now in treatment for a chemical addiction. You remind me of Billy Crystal. <laughs> It would have broken Tobias's heart if he'd known she was about to say Billy Crystal uh, Meth, a fine. funny drug dealer. As the only outsider in the Bluth family, Tobias is starving for positive support. The sort you might expect from a family, but not if that family is the Bluths. It's a reminder of how non-typical this family is, and Tobias being a part of it for over 20 years has borne the brunt of that reality. Tobias spends much of his story assembling a new family, ostensibly to put on a production of a Fantastic Four musical, but in reality, he really loves being surrounded by a positive, caring group of people who are willing to indulge his dream of becoming an actor. It still doesn't end well, because Tobias is terrible at acting, but in spite of his loss of fortunes, he seems happier struggling to get by with debris than he ever did with Lindsay, who never appreciated his better qualities. Lindsay's plotline is perhaps the most political the show's gotten up to this point. She leaves Tobias for a young activist named Marky Bark, played by Chris Diamantopoulos. Although things are nice at first, she eventually realizes that a life of a simple ostrich farmer isn't for her. She eventually drops Marky to be with Herbert Love, played by Terry Crews. Perhaps dating the show, Herbert is a reference to Herman Cain, who was running for the Republican nomination in 2012 before dropping out after he was accused of sexually harassing multiple women. Lindsay, charmed by his wealth, doesn't realize Herbert Love has hired her as an escort, with payment going to maybe as her pimp. It would take too long to explain how that happened, so let's keep moving. Jumping ahead to the conclusion, eventually Lindsay leaves Herbert, only to end up replacing him on the campaign trail. After being robbed by someone she thought was a Mexican man, Lindsay gives a speech that will sound very familiar. They don't belong here, we belong here. Put up this wall. Put up this wall! Which was originally her mother's idea. This episode aired over two years before Donald Trump would announce his bid to become the president, though the wall on the southern border had long been a talking point in right-wing politics. Ironically, Lindsay was in some ways meant to model Hillary Clinton, as seen by the distinct hairstyle she sports at the close of one episode. This storyline about building a wall on the southern border ran through a number of characters' plotlines, but the connection to Lindsay was particularly interesting as it spoke to the potential popularity of reactionary politics. As parody, it seemed fitting, but in our current reality, it comes across as prophetic. One thing season 4 simply can't escape is how utterly confusing it is. Although it somehow makes sense when finished, the experience going through each episode can be frustrating, particularly if it's your first time. Plot twists often get no explanation, jokes aren't paid off, and it's easy to miss familiar faces that would take several episodes to reappear. It also didn't help that each episode had such a lengthy runtime that even watching a single episode felt more taxing than perhaps it should have. In an effort to explain the plot, episodes are packed with flashbacks, flash-forwards, and heavy narration. Narration that gets disorienting when Ron Howard himself shows up for a subplot involving Michael trying to sell his family's story to Imagine Entertainment, only for Michael to imperil the deal when he mistakenly assumes his new girlfriend, Rebel, played by Isla Fisher, is Ron Howard's mistress. The truth comes out in one of Tobias's episodes. Did you not know that I'm Rebel's dad? I thought that, 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 that you might also be her, her lover. I get it. I was arrested as a sex offender. But at least I knew it was my daughter I was arrested for coming on to. The other guy Rebel is dating is George Maharis. Who is that? No one. George Michael, looking for a new identity, is going by George Maharis now, and Rebel was impressed by his software company that would hide your online footprint, FakeBlock, which doesn't exist. At least, not as a software company, it's actually just an app that's a fake woodblock. I hope you can see how confusing this is all getting. The season's fixation on individual characters does have some strengths, though. The plotlines dive deep into who these characters are, and these include moments of realization for these characters, occasionally summed up by other characters. You know, your whole life is an escape act, 
and this girl seems like she really likes you. Why don't you just try to work it out and just stop running? What you are is the invisible girl. You make it impossible for people to see you in order to protect yourself. And that's when Maybe, who had spent so long lying to others, and even herself, finally had to admit she had made a huge mistake. I know I'm fine. Well, not everyone has a moment of realization. There was also an intriguing plotline involving a private investigator really emphasizing how the family was dissolving. Where the hell am I going to find a PI? Gene Parmesan, at your service. <laughs> Guy gets me every time. This season does have a unique ending compared to every other season of Arrested Development, though. Michael, through some sly maneuvering, tries to get George Michael out of Rebel's life without George Michael finding out they're dating the same woman. And when the truth comes out, instead of closing with father and son somehow taking off from the family once again, as seen in previous seasons, this happens instead. It's like we're identical twins. And that's how the season ends, with George Michael finally standing up to his father and, we hope, possibly breaking the Fluth family cycle. By lying to his son and being even more like his father than he had been before, Michael was setting up George Michael to be the same put-upon son that Michael was. George Michael punching his father in the face is him rejecting that role for himself. There are a few post credit scenes with Buster being arrested for murdering Lucille too, and Rod Howard excitedly talking about a movie based on him, but it would be some time before those particular threads would be followed up on. The season ended as one of the most densely structured seasons of a sitcom I have ever seen. Storylines layered on top of one another, intersecting almost randomly, and a single joke could happen simultaneously across multiple episodes. It was ambitious, uneven, and deeply polarizing. Even though Arrested Development had returned, its fourth season wasn't the universal triumph the hype was demanding. Oh, come on! Netflix doesn't publish its viewing numbers, so we can't know for certain how well this season performed. A third party that measured numbers at the time reported that 36% of devices connected to Netflix on the Sunday premiere watched at least part of one episode of the series. That's three times the number of people who watched House of Cards, which was one of the strongest Netflix originals at the time. A few months after the show premiered, Netflix's chief content officer, Ted Sarandos, apparently pleased with the show's performance, said that Arrested Development would be returning to the streaming service at some point in the future. They just weren't sure when or what form it would take. Mitch Hurwitz also discussed plans he had for the series on Netflix, possibly airing material that had been filmed but not used in the fourth season. He also describes some kind of long-term plot for Tracy Bluth, Michael's deceased wife who very briefly appeared in season 4 on an old tape. She also looks like Isla Fisher, which makes the whole relationship Rebel had with Michael and George Michael extra creepy. When discussing the end of the season, with George Michael punching his father, Hurwitz said in an interview, What is the next step if you were to have that kind of situation with your father, the closest person to you? What does happen next? As it turns out, I do have answers to that, but I just need someone to let me make them. The original plan of doing a movie next was still very much in Hurwitz's mind, though unlike the period after season 3 ended, he said that there would be less teasing until plans were firmly in place, and he had some idea of a release date. Not all the reactions to the fourth season were quite so optimistic for the future though. In contrast to the overwhelmingly positive response of the original, the fourth season proved to be more polarizing. Some felt it was too much of a departure from the original, others appreciated its novel approach to storytelling. Regardless, the fact remains that it was a divisive season. After season 4 aired, Mitch Hurwitz posted a handwritten note to the show's Facebook page. It read, in part, We are also grateful for another chance to bring these characters to life and could not have done so without your consistent effort to spread the word about it. Although obviously in the case of the enemies, the words you spread were, Don't watch this show. You know, I probably shouldn't have even included them in the salutation, but I'm writing this in ink, plus making all sorts of mistakes. Did you notice the S at the end of the word done? While it's obviously a bit tongue-in-cheek, it's clear that Horowitz was hearing a round of criticism about the fourth season, unlike the first three seasons. In an interview several years later, Horowitz reflected on some of the criticisms the season got. It got positioned in the press, saying, Even Horowitz thought it wasn't his best work. Well, actually, I did think it was my best work but I did acknowledge that it was and wasn't. The other thing that was interesting about it is that some articles will say, 
so-so reception. But it wasn't so-so. It was, this is great, or this is horrible. And even that is what you hope for. I mean, you don't hope for this is horrible, but you do hope to do something that's novel enough at a certain point in your career that people have strong reactions to it. It's hard to map out the overall interest in a TV series over the span of years, particularly when it isn't on the air and there are no ratings to consult. But as a show that lived off the hype of the internet, interest in Arrested Development can be seen, at least in part, on a Google Trends graph. Looking at how interest has changed since 2004, we can see it regularly scoring above 10 for over a decade, shooting up slightly when news broke about its return at the New Yorker Festival reunion. Interest in the show exploded for its fourth season debut, but then dropped entirely. What's most interesting though is that while previous years had the show scoring a 10 on the interest scale, give or take one or two, after season four it was scoring either a six or seven. That's a drop of roughly 40% of interest in the show. While it's probably the case that stories about the rumored movie helped bolster interest earlier on, it's also true that, for some fans, Season 4 undercut a lot of their interest in this series. The late spike in the interest chart does point to something else though, and that's the show's eventual return for a fifth season on Netflix, split into two parts, each being eight episodes. In spite of the mixed response to the fourth season, there was no hesitation on all the parties involved creatively to do more. Hurwitz explained, saying, The studio wanted to do it. Netflix wanted to do it, the actors wanted to do it, I wanted to do it, but we all have to want to do it at the same time. Ahead of the release of the fifth season, we did get a second look at the fourth though. On May 3rd, 2018, Netflix released a re-edited version of the fourth season called Fateful Consequences. This version of the season would remix the series so that the story was told in a more chronological order. Instead of focusing on a single character, episodes would include scenes from the stories of multiple characters. So what was once an episode that only followed Job would be replaced by an episode that followed Job, George Sr., and Buster. Episodes were also much shorter, being kept to a stricter 22-minute length. The season also ended up running for a few episodes longer because of that. A few scenes were cut, including jokes that no longer made sense with the newly edited versions, and a few were added in using additional audio that was recorded. It also introduced a lot more narration to help fill in the blanks created when future events no longer had teases in earlier episodes. There were aspects of the series that simply couldn't be changed, such as how few scenes featured the Blue family interacting with each other, and for jokes that fell flat the first time around, they didn't really get better the second. The reaction to the remix was, well, mixed. Five years after the original had aired, it found a loyal group of fans who enjoyed its structural departure from the first three seasons, and there were fans of the early seasons who appreciated it feeling more like those ones. If you're interested in watching the fourth season on Netflix, it's the remixed version that's presented on its page for season four. To find the original cut of the fourth season, you have to look under the trailers and more section just to spot it. While the original cut had five years for people to ponder its significance, the remix would not have nearly as much time as only days after it was released. Netflix announced that the first half of season five of Arrested Development would be aired a few weeks later, on May 29th, 2018. But there would be a few bumps on the way to that release. A few months before the release of the fifth season, Jeffrey Tambor, who had been starring in the series Transparent, was fired after he was alleged to have sexually harassed several women working on the production. Afterwards, in an interview about the incident, Tambor admitted to having been difficult on the set, though he insisted that he had not crossed the line into sexual harassment. When the news broke, filming for the fifth season of Arrested Development had already been completed, and Tambor was too integral to the series to be edited out, so it was never seriously considered to do that season without him. In an interview, Mitch Hurwitz said, we were done shooting. There was no version of cutting him out of the show, or there would be no show. Am I going to cut Jeffrey out of the show based on allegations that he disputes, that Amazon hasn't shared, and that we have never experienced any complaints about? No, of course I am not going to. I'm going to support Jeffrey. Netflix head of content, Ted Sarandos, also expressed that Tambor had never been anything but professional in their history working together. However, ahead of the premiere, Jeffrey Tambor sat down for an interview with The Hollywood Reporter where he mentioned that he had a blow-up on the set of Arrested Development while filming its fifth season with Jessica Walter. He added that he profusely apologized afterwards, but it raised a question that would come up in several interviews with the press as the fifth season was being promoted, and most crucially, in an interview with The New York Times. The interview included Jessica Walter, Jeffrey Tambor, Jason Bateman, David Cross, Tony Hale, and Aaliyah Shawkat. 
During the interview, the subject came up of Jeffrey Tambor's behavior on the set of Arrested Development's fifth season. Although Jessica Walter was the subject, Jason Bateman and David Cross talked over her, coming to the defense of Tambor. It went on for a bit, until we finally got to hear from Jessica Walter. Here's audio from that moment in the interview. It's a very amorphous process, this, this sort of bullshit that we do, you know, making a fake life. It's a weird thing, and it is a breeding ground for um, atypical behavior, and certain people have certain processes. But that doesn't mean it's acceptable, and no, the point I, is that things are changing and people need to respect thing, each other differently. I, I just realized in this conversation, I have to let go of the, being angry at him. He never crossed the line on our show with any you know, sexual, whatever. Verbally, yes, he harassed me, but I, he did apologize. I have to let it go, and I, I have to give you a chance to, to, you know, for us to be friends again. Absolutely. But it, it's, it's hard, because honestly, Jason says this happens all the time. In like almost 60 years of working, I've never had anybody yell at me like that on a set. And it's hard to, to deal with it, but I'm, I'm over it now. I just let it go right here for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't give it up for anybody else. Hearing the emotion in Jessica Walter's voice and just how extreme the harassment, and as she plainly says, the worst she's experienced in her career, it does bring the incident into perspective. And it's unfortunate that in that moment of the interview, Jason Bateman, David Cross, and Tony Hale all had moments where they seemed more concerned about repairing Jeffrey Tambor's reputation than giving Walter the space she needed to tell her story about what happened. Although Walter herself was ready to move on, there was significant backlash to the interview. Jason Bateman, David Cross, and Tony Hale all issued apologies. Bateman's apology on Twitter was particularly frank, saying, I was so eager to let Jeffrey know that he was supported in an attempt to learn, grow, and apologize that I completely underestimated the feelings of the victim, another person I deeply love. And she was sitting right there. I'm incredibly embarrassed and deeply sorry to have done that to Jessica. This is a big learning moment for me. There's never any excuse for abuse in any form from any gender, and the victim's voice needs to be heard and respected. In response to a greater understanding of the incident, Hurwitz said in an interview, I realize now I clearly misread the situation, given how Jessica has revealed she felt about it. There was more to it than I realized, and it's not my place to opine about what I believe was the weight of it. I misinterpreted what I understood to have played out, and more importantly, the depth of Jessica's pain about it. I felt so bad about that. I feel bad because I love these people. I feel bad for very personal reasons. And because I had been viewing this through the lens of a family member who assumed that any discord, regardless of who was upset with who, existed within the context of a family that cared about each other. And that was a mistake. Of course we were at work, and we're not really related. That's why we have different last names. And I wish I'd known or made a greater effort to know the pain it caused. Speaking to Vice a few weeks later, Aaliyah Shawkat, the only person in the interview who seemed to intervene on behalf of Jessica, offered more reflections on the incident. I looked at Jessica and I could see how it was sitting with her, and it wasn't good. She comes in and she tries to speak for a little while, and again they keep going. In that room, when I look back on it, I wish I was able to gather myself, to not be afraid to speak out war and realize that I wouldn't be hurting anybody, but actually helping. I know I said a little, but what I wish I had said was, stop talking, stop, Jessica, go on. There's a lot of men who've not been accused of anything that haven't taken the time to think about this. What's more important to me is that these men, whether they've been accused of anything or not, need to start looking at this movement and realizing it has a lot to do with them. I hope that the guys on the show and now all these men of all different ages start to communicate with the women in their lives, the women they work with, and just ask openly with no shame, what can I do to be better? One response to the interview from Linda Holmes, writing for NPR, cut to the heart of why this particular interview managed to resonate so strongly. It's not the worst story, not by a mile. It may not even be Tambor's worst story, but seeing a woman so brilliant withstand repeated efforts by people who say they love her to recast her experiences as normal when she knew they were not, it was a lot to take. It should also be mentioned that Jessica Walter never stepped forward with her story of her own will. It was revealed by Jeffrey Tambor, and she was then forced to comment on it directly herself. Whether it was a positive story or not, it really is their own personal right to tell their story, including whether or not they want to share it at all. 
The incidents regarding Tambor were not the only popular subjects that came up during the press tour, though. Many connections had been made between the Bluth family and the Trump family at the time. A group of immoral developers, one of whom was running for office with a slogan about building a wall on the southern border. The connection was pretty clear, and the show wasn't going to pretend it didn't exist. This was also seen as a way for bringing Arrested Development back to its roots, making it the way it once was. In another interview, Horowitz elaborated, saying, Nobody has quite dealt with the mess they've made. It makes me think of what was going on with America. We're all growing. We're finally having an African-American president. We're finally acknowledging transgender people and allowing gay marriage. And then it's like, no, let's pretend none of that happened. Let's just go back to what it was. It's just easier. So that's a big undercurrent in this. He laughs. Which is also funny because it's what the fans want. Just go back. Make it great again. Make Arrested greedy again. One other change that would face the fifth season of Arrested Development was the absence of Portia de Rossi. In 2017, at her request, she was written off the series Scandal and had intended to step away from acting entirely to focus on her new business, an art curation and publication company called General Public. However, she did make an exception for Arrested Development. Although her appearance would be very limited, only appearing in a handful of episodes, making her storyline of running for Congress far less prominent than originally planned. The lead-in to the fifth season didn't generate nearly as much buzz as the fourth season. The atmosphere around the show was almost a night and day difference heading into the fifth season premiere. Because of its connection to the previous season, there are quite a few recaps in the early episodes of season 5. The first episode opens with 4 minutes worth of them. Although season 5 was an attempt to return Arrested Development to its earlier formula, it did carry over the idea of a season-long narrative that season 4 used. The first three seasons have arcs that lasted multiple episodes, but they were often discreet and not part of a larger narrative that many of the arcs in season 4 and 5 were. It makes for a more cohesive experience, though it does cost the show some of the manic energy of those earlier seasons. The attempt to shift back to an earlier format and not being able to get there reflects a major theme through the season, feelings of regret of trying to recapture the past. After being punched in the face by his son, the dynamic between them now carries the implicit threat of violence. Are you going down or...? No, I forgot my, my bag. Well, it's good to see you. <laughs> Ciao. Bella. The uniquely American character of the Bluths is reflected in George Michael's trip to Mexico, made comfortable with how Americanized the country is. They saw a foreign film. I'm glad someone had the guts to give the Minions their own movie. It's great because it's subtitled in Spanish, but we don't have to read because it's in English. To make it even more explicit, the show also makes direct references to the U.S. government. They're helping these people because nobody else will. They've been kicked out of the only country they've ever known for their whole lives because of the cruelty of your president, Barack Obama. The Obama callout at a time when the Trump administration was being criticized for its border policy is especially clever. It reveals how partisanship blinds people to the cruelty that is consistent in American policies towards its southern border, regardless of the party in power. One side may be worse, but neither is good. In that way, the show is critiquing the right-wing shift in American politics and the response to it during the Trump years. Going back to the way things were isn't enough of a correction. People need to demand genuine political change, or as seen in the case of maybe, take matters into their own hands the way she did, and start helping out directly. Not that maybe really sticks with it. One thing that the show is very quick to remind people of is that the Bluths will never be our saviors, even though they certainly project the idea that they've grown. It was during the 1992 African-American riots, and they had every right. They had every mm. right. Every right. Mm. But their left-wing politics are entirely performative. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border. Which was my idea. And I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Okay. That is a clever twist. This is being used to criticize a narrative that was being built at the time. The Bluths represent conservatives who were, supposedly, turning into liberals as a response to the hard right turn of the Republican Party. The show is revealing these people, like the Bluths, to be grifters cynically using the Trump backlash liberals expressed to accrue power for themselves, acting the part of a sensitive, caring family while literally building a wall on the southern border. These are people who feed on the politics of hate. And to nail this point home, we see Lindsay lean into the cruelty once, maybe, her campaign manager realizes it plays well to a certain part of the electorate. Perhaps I've 
called incorrectly. I'm positively knackered. The candidate made no fans in Wee Britain, but on the other side of the Anaheim pond, the comment only made her more popular. And just like that, the liberal posturing fades away when there's an opportunity to seize real power. It isn't that the Bluths find someone like Donald Trump objectionable. As former pals with the Bush administration, they just don't like the idea of another odious person taking the party from them. This cynical form of politics, where people are motivated to vote through hatred, either towards a group of people or a political candidate, is highlighted when Debris, posing as Lindsay during a parade, wears a sheet because of her anxiety. It was a message that was easily interpreted through the lens of one's particular bias. She's a Muslim. She's disrespecting Muslims. She's a ghost. She's disrespecting ghosts. But equally hated by all. Arrested Development is taking a very hard stance against the politics of hate and how it exists across the electoral spectrum. Rather than simply admonish the Bluths entirely, though, the season does offer an interesting insight into why that family is so broken. It's foreshadowed early on when Tobias has some surprisingly wise words for Lucille. Hurt people hurt people. Oh, that's nice. I always say make people cry, make people cry, but yours includes the people who don't want to give you the satisfaction. In the second half of the season, we go back in time to get an idea of where some of this hurt comes from. We see the Blues in their summer home, back when Job, Michael, Lindsay, and Buster were all children. Is anybody else worried she's ruining us? Take them back! You take them back! Okay, down. We also meet Grandma Mimi, played by Jean Smart, who reveals where Lucille got her mean streak. The younger Lucille is played by Kobe Smulders. You never let me wear the sash when I was little. No, please, you were never little. Your mother was never little. These scenes set in the past unfold in the episode surrounding Buster's trial, as he's the top suspect in the murder of Lucille too. There's a subtle hint that the jury is turning against him. What a f baby! Shut up, murderer! Luckily, one surprise witness starts to turn the trial on its head. Has anyone checked under the new bailiff? Gene Parmesan. Ah, Gene! And I swear to tell the truth, so help me God. That never gets old! Gene's testimony did not help Buster. The trial also reveals that the flashbacks we had seen in several episodes were actually a TV series being produced by Ron Howard based on the life of Buster and the death of Mimi. But you're not my mother! Mother's my mother! Grandmother! And I actually think it's a pretty good advertisement for the show. Of course, we still haven't gotten Brian's notes, and obviously we're going to put Gene Smart's face on the stuntman. Although things look grim for Buster, having been accused of murdering his grandmother and Lucille too, Michael, fulfilling his dream of being a lawyer, manages to turn the whole thing around. Michael's out of control. You're out of control. So maybe I was out of control that night, but at least I can admit it. Admit what? You're talking like you killed Lucille Ostero. You're goddamn right I did. In this moment, Michael is fulfilling his destiny of holding the Bluth family together, being the hero he always imagined himself to be by revealing himself to be a murderer. I mean, you think you have to be the hero? Yeah, no, I don't think that. I am the... <laughs> Turns out I'm the worst. I'm the worst Bluth. Never say that. Job is the worst. Michael's idea of himself as a hero, coupled with doing something monstrous, helps him reveal what it means to be a hero in the Bluth family, and that can be extended to reframe his domineering parenting of George Michael as monstrous as well. He treats his son the way his father treated him, thinking he was a hero doing it the whole time. So while George Michael consistently resists his father, Michael tries to hold his son even closer. George Michael struggles to create distance and hold on to his family identity, wanting to stay connected in this relationship that's shaping him into someone more like his father than he'd like to admit. Someone's gotta protect this family. Well, what about their families? I really got to know some of those people when I was working in that border town, acting like I was getting to know those people. You sound just like a slightly self-aware Aunt Lindsay. Well, you sound just like a minimally woke Uncle Michael. Michael and George Michael finally decide to settle things. And that's when, in my opinion, George Michael went too far. You could both use a hit. As did Michael. Except this is a scheme too, because if there's one thing the Blues excel at, it's scheming. And Please. while these no longer amiable okay. businessmen well, signed their okay please. to taking over a company from a family you. that had fallen apart, 
a father and son signed their okay, knowing they hadn't. George Michael and Michael have learned to work together, not against one another. And while that still takes the shape of being Bluths, screwing over some other people, they seem to have made it work well enough that at least they aren't hurting each other. And maybe by trusting each other, they can start to rebuild their lives into something better. And in the finale, we find out the truth about Lindsay's parents. She's actually Lucille's half-sister. You hid this ugly secret from me so I wouldn't know my mother deserted me? So, you were a critical, difficult mother. But I gotta be honest, Lucy, you're an amazing sister. <laughs> half-sister. And as it looks like the family is coming together, Michael and George Michael do what they do best, and that's take off. And it wasn't Michael that killed Lucille too, that was Buster. Okay, I did it. So, but doesn't she remind you of Mom? And that's how season 5 came to an end. Plot lines colliding, traditions being upheld, and a stark reminder that the Bluths are everything that's bad with America. We don't get a tease for the next season, there is no epilogue, and there are no other signs we might see the Bluths once again in the future. Just a stair car exiting stage left, leaving Sudden Valley, perhaps forever. There's always money in the banana stand! The fifth season of Arrested Development did not receive nearly as much attention as the fourth, and was similarly not as passionately hated or appreciated. Although the interview in the New York Times got a lot of attention, that didn't translate to people talking about the show's return very much. The content of the show didn't do much to help. While it may not have been bad, and in some ways it was pretty good, it was clear that the show wasn't going to have the impact it once did. And while it was clever to weave that into the narrative, it may not have come together as well as had been intended. In the third episode of the fifth season, there's a reference to a very old internet meme, the Star Wars Kid. He even inspired a certain move that would eventually appear two years later in a Han Solo origin picture. This was referenced in the original run of Arrested Development, as well as the season 4 revival. Not only is this joke now 16 years old being an internet meme, it feels even more dated. Arrested Development is similarly starting to feel tired. While I appreciate a long-running gag as much as anyone, even Gene Parmesan, not every joke is built to last, and comedy is infamous for aging poorly. The Star Wars kid joke, for example, is not just an early meme, but one of the first major incidents of a teen being bullied by the internet. The poor kid's life got turned upside down because a video that was posted by someone else made him a laughingstock. While in some ways the series was fairly good about growing over time and discarding some of its more controversial material, there were still moments like this that really made the show feel trapped in the past, and all for preserving a cruel joke that was long past its expiration date. More than a stale joke, the series itself felt like it was treading water. The Bluths are terrible people, and it's an intergenerational phenomena that can be extrapolated to the American experience. Lovely, but does it need to return every five years to deliver that message again? The fifth season is, of course, not irredeemable. The political commentary was sharp, the Michael and George Michael story did take some interesting steps forward, and there were some genuine laughs to be had. But as a show, it struggled to capture anyone's attention, as can be seen in much of the audience's reaction. In an article for The Verge, Keith Phipps summed it up nicely, saying, Arrested Development was once a special show. Now it's a show struggling to remind viewers why it's special. This raises the important question, is this the end for Arrested Development? In an interview, Mitch Hurwitz expressed a desire to do more. Here's an excerpt from a 2018 article. It flows so easily out of this cast, it's hard not to want to do more. It may be another epic way. We've always been underdogs, he says. Nobody ever got cocky. Really, we're all still just trying so hard. So actually, the every few years thing works great for me because it's hard to get a laugh through to that screen. The cast was less committed, though Will Arnett offered an interesting perspective saying, I like the idea that we're all working towards arrested development, last Bluth standing. Mitch has written out versions where each one of us is the last person, depending on who lasts the longest. And I predict it will be me. Yeah, I'm gonna outlive everyone. David Cross, speaking on a podcast, seemed less convinced that the show would ever return. In particular, he cited the challenging work schedule and the hardship of it on the cast. So, now, you can definitively say it's, it's over. over. It's over. How do you how do you know that? Or what, what, I, yeah, what I do you... Know. I know. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have full scripts. 
I mean, it was uh, it was a terrible way for actors to try to do what they do. And the, there were a lot of frustrations early on. The shoot kept extending. You know, you're asking a lot of people, and especially older people, who, do, who just don't have the, the physical stamina that some younger cast and crew do. And it led to some tensions. And it was, it's just not a, it was a, a very bad way to work. David Cross also said he believed the show was over back in 2010, though clearly fate had other plans for the show. Sadly, this time it seems like fate took another turn, and it's unlikely that Arrested Development will return, or at least it can never be the same show again. Jason Bateman's career trajectory changed completely after Arrested Development ended its third season. He went from appearing in sitcom pilots destined to fail to appearing in big-budget movies such as Horrible Bosses, Hancock, and Zootopia. Most notably, he starred in and directed several episodes of the Netflix series Ozark. Will Arnett's career experienced a big boost after appearing on the show, going on to appear in movies and TV shows, though perhaps it's voice work that's given him the most acclaim, having starred in BoJack Horseman and portraying Lego Batman in multiple Lego movies. Portia de Rossi would go on to appear on the show's Better Off Ted, Nip Tuck, and Scandal, though as mentioned earlier, she would leave acting in 2018 and is now currently focusing on her new business venture, General Public. Michael Sarah starred in the movies Superbad, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Juno, and a host of other projects that needed an awkward teen boy. In many ways, his style of teenage boy became a trend in the 2000s. Most recently, he voiced Hank in the movie Paws of Fury, The Legend of Hank. Aaliyah Shawcat has been very prolific since Arrest Development gave her career its first big break. She's appeared in dozens of TV shows and movies, most recently starring in the series Search Party, which ended its fifth season in early 2022. Tony Hale would appear in a number of projects after Arrested Development changed his career, including a lengthy run on the series Veep. Most recently, he's appeared in Hocus Pocus 2 and done voice work for the Harley Quinn TV series. Jeffrey Tambor's career has come to a halt after he was fired from Transparent for allegedly sexually harassing several of the women who worked on the production. Jessica Walter would take on another Lucille Bluth-esque role as Mallory Archer on the show Archer. In interviews promoting the fifth season of Arrested Development, when asked if she would return to the show, she believed that within five years she would be too old to keep acting. Sadly, she would only be around for another three. She passed away in her sleep on March 24th, 2021. Classic is a term that's given to a work of art that either has, or is expected to, pass the test of time, remembered well after its debut and often outliving the artist or artists who created it. Arrested Development had the immense advantage of achieving a cult status amongst a passionate viewership and critics with its first three seasons. In 2012, its position as a classic might have been guaranteed, depending on who you asked, but its divisive return in 2013 and its less noticed return in 2018 have complicated that confidence in its classic status. Art isn't created in a vacuum, and it's through influencing new art that older works are often remembered, and by being remembered, become more likely to be thought of as a classic. So in that sense, those are the viewers who may matter the most. Arrested Development will be remembered as a great work of art by being remembered by artists who will go on to create great works of art of their own, creating a vast tapestry of classic television. Arrested Development may or may not be over, or at the very least, if it comes back, it certainly can't be the same without Jessica Walter. But its status as a classic doesn't seem to be under a serious threat. It may speak to the strength of the original three seasons, but perhaps more importantly, it speaks to the strength of the memory of those seasons in the minds that made the show a classic. Can you tell that this video took nearly seven hours to record? Yeah, it's one of my longest ever, and uh, it was a challenge writing something this big for a show that didn't even last 100 episodes. All of this coming together in one big package, I really hope it is good and people enjoyed it. If you are someone who enjoyed it and you're thinking, I'd like to see more of those, well, I've got a bunch of other TV show retrospectives you can check out. And you can also make sure I keep making more in the future by supporting this channel financially. You can become a patron or a member and you'll get your name floating up the screen like all these lovely people here. In addition to that, you'll get early access to new videos as I make them, plus other fun extras that I throw in every now and again. 
If you would like to support the channel in a non-monetary fashion though, you can do that by liking, commenting, and subscribing if you haven't already, and do hit the bell for notifications. I want to thank everyone so much for watching all the way into the end. And this was a, a real challenge to narrate, and I want to ask Ron Howard, how do you think I did? Real shoddy narrating. Just pure crap. You, Ron.